So one of the subjects that is radically changed in your understanding with the non-dual understanding is that of focus. So previously when we identified with being a mind, we thought that <laughs> focus was something that our mind did. And so when we realized that our mind is actually that something that consciousness is doing, um, apparently doing, then focus becomes a completely different kind of thing. And this is where the term channeling comes in, in meditation. So in meditation, you're intensely focusing, but not on any one specific thing. So in meditation, there's a kind of this strange paradox that when we're talking about it and using the mind to understand, we have to explain in a paradox that it's both an intense focus and a complete like letting go of something being focused on. So both those things are happening in once in the experience of meditation that sort of like opposite or conflict is resolved. And the other way it can happen is in sort of like a channeling experience or think of a master pianist and how he is not thinking about how focused he is. He's not thinking about how well he's doing. He's not thinking of himself whatsoever. He's just completely in the flow of that activity. And that's what mastery teaches us as well as this like intense active form of meditation. And there's also an emotional component to focus with meditation as we are pay we're increasing our sensitivity, we're paying more and more attention to how we feel and feeling is integrated into our experience and our understanding. So whereas before we might think about um, things as I need to stay focused on the subject, I have this problem that I need to fix in my life and so I need to stay focused on this problem. We may rob ourselves of the opportunity to be distracted by the squirrel outside the window who may actually in our mind like going in that area and letting go of the resistance of the problem, there may be some crazy insight there. Or you know how epiphanies happen sort of when you're, you really, really want a solution to a problem and you let go of the resistance and sometimes like if you take a nap or just do some sort of activity, relaxation activity that's completely, has nothing to do with it, you might, the answer just might come to you. And that's sort of like connecting to infinite intelligence and whereas before we thought we were a mind and we thought that we could own the contents of the mind and focus the contents of the mind, we realize that there's a much more, a much deeper and a much more efficient way to focus that to the mind looks like complete distraction. And it can be kind of hard to sell this to people who are really identified with the mind and they they believe or we believe or the mind believes that we're going to get something out of doing something and so um when we we become more in tune to what we have resistance to sometimes we realize that focus is just some sort of ideal that we're imposing upon ourselves and really what we're noticing more of is when we're not focused. And so this becomes this sort of hilarious thing where the mind is like, I'm not focused. And in that noticing that it's not focused and, and feeling wrong and trying to correct it, it's actually the distraction is in that noticing and in that belief that the mind can and should be in the state of focus. And so emotionally in our life, this plays out as how we're feeling. And so thoughts, when we're thinking thoughts that don't feel good or when we're not feeling good, that's a true indicator that there's a lack of focus there, that we are not, we're not 
focused or we're not living or not thinking or we're not seeing or experiencing in a way that is aligned with consciousness or what our true nature, what we truly are or source or God or whatever word you want to say it. And I had this really cool experience of this where I was, I kept thinking these ridiculously negative thoughts. And um, I was at my parents' house and I, it was just like some quiet time. I remember I put my head down on the table and I was just thinking this. And I was realizing like how ridiculous and silly it was that there was nothing, there was nothing I could hold on to to keep myself in this mood. And like somehow or other, I just started to see this. And I saw over time, like my thoughts continually improving and continually becoming more curious. And as I was driving home, we came by a bunch of houses that had a ton of Christmas lights on them. So I was pointing them out to my kids. And just a day before, I'd been noticing people putting Christmas lights up and thinking about how it's a really dark time of year. And especially this year with the pandemic, a lot of people are depressed. And I was thinking about what an act of love it is to put up Christmas lights because it's something bright and beautiful that people can focus on. And so we're looking at the Christmas lights and we come by the gas station and just being funny, I point out the red strip of lights and I'm like, and there's the gas station. I'm like, that's always there. I'm like, what a stupid thing Christmas lights really are that, you know, they're essentially the same thing as the strip of lights on the gas station. But because we only put them up a certain time of year and because they have this purpose and we know they're put up out of this sort of Christmas spirit, we feel that too. So it completely changes our perspective about it. And those kind of things, like sometimes with non-duality and enlightenment, people see that realization and they're like, oh, Christmas lights are so meaningless. This is all so meaningless. But to me, it's like, oh, like that light is within me. And that resonance and that spirit and that joy is completely like inherent. It's everywhere. It's so completely like unconditional love <laughs> that we want, we want it to be one thing above the other. And so this other example came to me because my, at my parents' house, my, um, I like, I go to my parents' house just about every day to run my dog and my kids see my parents every day. But anyway, my mom found my little beanie babies in the attic and so we brought them down and I'm letting my daughter pick out a couple like every time she's there and play with them. And it reminded me of when I collected those Beanie Babies. I would go up to my dad and I would ask him with like a couple of them and I would ask him which his favorite was. And I don't know why I did this, but he, so I'd like make him pick a favorite. And when he did, I would ask him, well, what's wrong? I'd get offended. And I would say, what's wrong with this one you didn't pick? And eventually he got so annoyed by me doing this that he uh, told me, he's like, I don't, it doesn't mean I don't like the other one. It doesn't mean that. Why do you keep asking me this? And I was talking to him about it and he like completely <laughs> ranted about his true feelings of like how awful that was that I kept doing that. But I think like I was trying to understand or illustrate that this is what the mind is doing. Like all the Beanie Babies, they're all nice, but in trying to pick, in our selecting, if we don't just, you know, select from life the experiences we want to have, the thoughts we want to think, the people we want to spend time with, the things we want to do, but instead look at the other things that we're not doing or look at the political party we don't identify with and bash it instead of like really seeing the beauty in, 
in everything, in like the the amazing creation of everything and seeing the whole picture, we're focused on what we don't like. And in feeling truly, in awareness, there is no exclusion. It's complete unconditional love. It's so all-encompassing. It's so all-inclusive that it threatens us because we, the mind keeps wanting to think that love means like I, with the Beanie Babies, I, I wanted him to pick one and like real, to, cause that's sort of what I thought liking something or being attracted to something or loving something was, that you had to like one over the other. So you had to have reasons why you didn't like the other. And that is what our minds are doing constantly. And we are feeling the whole time what we're not paying attention to in our misfocusing on this is that feeling is not going along with those things. And when you're looking at a political party or something happening in the world that you really don't agree with, you in feeling it feels terrible. And this is the power of focus and it all like it all sort of goes back to aligning with the qualities of awareness. And there's so many things like this that just come out and you can realign yourself with. And another um, sort of concept that's really helpful in these things is understanding hedonic adaptation. So it's like, I've spoken about this in the past, but it just seems so key to me. And it's like you, you win the lottery. And then all these things happen after that. You buy your dream car and then you hit it. You hit something with the car and you have to fix it and you have to bash it in. And your mood goes along the entire time, goes along with the things that are happening to you and it's as if you hadn't won the lottery. Well, this in like this unconditional love that we truly are is like whole and everything in itself. And so in focus, it's like a complete like completely taking all your senses in and like going back to that space of awareness and and where that sort of like focus seems that focus or not focus duality seems to die and that's the true focus and from there we can determine what is really worthy of our focus.